Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. After 50 years of collecting, the time has come to find new owners for my beloved artifacts. To the new potential owner, I often find a need to answer a question even before they ask it. The question being, why should they care? The quick and satisfying answer for many, probably most, would be that it just ought to be fun to clean up and get going. Well, yes, but the longer I've collected, the answer may lie in wanting to have artifacts with an interesting story. So I'm spending some time in trying to understand the story behind my prized artifacts, some of which in my earlier years I never really bothered to ask that why should I care question beyond the fact that it looks neat and it might be fun to fix up. So I come to this freshman Model Q of 1928. What may be the first American-made AC mains-powered receiver to use a screen grid vacuum tube? Definitions are important here. I need to note that earlier in the year, battery-powered receivers were being built using the Type 22 tube. At the same time, Separate mains-powered A and B battery eliminators were on the market to provide DC to light the filaments of the tubes. By 1926, radio frequency amplifier circuits for broadcast band reception using triode vacuum tubes were approaching their maximum gain capabilities. The most significant barrier to higher amplification capabilities was the internal capacity between the input circuit and the output circuit. External schemes were developed to neutralize this internal capacity to achieve significant improvement, but there were limits. As early as 1915, Walter Schottke in Germany proposed to interpose a shielding grid between the grid and plate circuit of the vacuum tube. It would take some 12 years for developers in several countries to implement refinements to produce a practical version of this vacuum tube. One or two screen grid tubes could easily exceed the performance of two or three stages of triode amplification. In 1928, U.S. radio magazines were full of glowing articles on how to use this new wonder. I count 63 in the search engines. These designs were for TRF and superheterodyne application. I might note that all these superhet designs were for kit or custom assembly shops since the RCA did not license the superhet technology to any other makers. The tube would not appear in any RCA products until their 1929 introduction of the Radiola 21, a TRF receiver for rural markets still needing battery-powered sets. I think the next RCA model to use this tube did not appear until the Radiola P-31 for the 1932 model year. It was a very heavy luggage-cased superhead portable, more accurately described as luggable for short distances and requiring connection to some sort of wire antenna, presumably thrown over a branch of a tree, etc. It appears that only three radio chassis built in 1928 used the UX-222 powered from AC mains and the freshman Model Q seems to have been the first to market. The September 1928 issue of Radio Retailing proclaims Simplified Radio, as exemplified by the new Model Q, represents not merely minor improvements, but a basic advance in radio science. Parts have been reduced in number and complexity. Points where trouble usually occurs in most other sets have been materially strengthened. The new UX222 shielded grid tube gives seven times greater radio frequency amplification than any other tube 
used for that purpose today. And sure enough, in a November 1928 article in Radio Magazine, you find the lead statement. This is the first factory-built AC receiver to use a screen grid tube as an RF amplifier. Here was a simple 5-tube AC set at a time when other well-known brands were still using 6 and 7 tube chassis with type 26 or 27 triodes for RF amplification. With only one screen grid RF stage, it had good enough sensitivity for local daytime use, but with just two tuned circuits, it was not going to satisfy the listener, especially at night when those DX stations started rolling in and crowding the band. But in large metropolitan areas, there was still probably prospects that a good number of people would be happy with this set at its relatively low price point. Note the voltage rating of the block of filter and bypass capacitors, 500 to 2000 volt. Alan Douglas notes in volume two of his excellent books, Radio Manufacturers of the 1920s, that in 1927, their first lines of AC powered radios at one time were reported to have a 60% return rate to the maker for failure of their power supplies. So here is my Model Q with a freshened up paint job by a long departed friend of mine. See the name tag? It says Model Q. Yay! I've got a first to market AC mains powered screen grid tube radio. A major technical advance. Time to take pictures of my marvelous radio. There is an expected shield over the single dial tuning capacitor. Easy to pull off for inspection so I can begin to identify components on my schematic. Hmm, something ain't right. The schematic shown two slides back identifies only two 360 picofarad tuning capacitors. I see three. What's that all about? It looks like the original Q circuit was too simplified to cut the mustard. My Model Q has these improvements. Most notable is that the plate circuit is now tuned and fixed regeneration has been returned to the antenna input. The 0 to 40 picofarad capacitor has been repurposed as a trimmer to improve tracking of the now three gang tuning capacitors. And there is a bit of voltage step up by making the antenna coil an auto transformer. This was certainly to make a better performer after dark. By November of 1928, Tierman has an all in one receiver chassis supplying AC to all the tube filaments. The search engine states that the Scots World's record SGAC-10 is from 1928, but it can find no advertisements until 1929. There was another screen grid tube announced in 1928 that could be powered from AC mains. This was part of a unique series of tubes employing 15 volt carbon filament heaters encased in a cathode sleeve, the sleeve being connected to one of the filament pins in the standard four-pin base. This picture shows the Arcturus Type 122. Arcturus made tubes branded as Sonora during that year, but it appears that they were not supplying the screen grid tube version to them until April 1929. I only found this detailed write-up in the December 1928 issue of Radio Broadcast Magazine for the Hamilton Roberts AC High Q29 TRF receiver that 
clearly details use of these 15 volt type 122 tubes. So what have I got here? The deeper I investigated, the more was revealed an inconvenient truth. My freshman Model Q is maybe not the first of its kind, but it is darn close. And that's not all. Some may know that this set was also marketed under the Polydyne brand that undercut their freshman distributors. Certainly not a good thing at an established network of businesses. Later in the year, the freshman brand would disappear in a November 1928 merger with the Fried Eisman Company. This colorful page is from the 1930 Allied Radio Catalog. The $19.50 price was bare bones. $29.18 would get you a set with tubes and an aerial kit. The loudspeaker was not included. These sets were probably not attracting as much interest as hoped for in the first half of the 1929 boom times. And these distributor prices probably indicate the new company with its Earl and Eisman branded radios, was dumping old product for whatever they could get. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.